Welcome to Building the Future. I'm your host, Kevin Horick. You can check out the radio version of the show every Tuesdays and Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern on WDJY 99.1 in Atlanta. We also air on a podcasting network in Los Angeles called the 405 Media. There's a TV version of the show that airs on KMVT 15 in Silicon Valley at 8 p.m. Pacific on Tuesday nights. Both versions of the show air in other states. For these show times plus past episodes, please visit the show's website at buildingthefutureshow.com. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com. Join me at the 10th Annual Media Excellence Awards on January 18th in Beverly Hills, California. The attendees and I will be celebrating innovation and leadership in technology and entertainment. There are 20 award categories with 1,000 nominees. These awards honor those who are creating groundbreaking technology to better our lives and celebrate the hard work, determination, and brilliance in the leadership within the companies which create the new world we live in today. I will be recording nominees and winners at the awards. For tickets and more information, go to MediaXAwards.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Daniel Tibbetts. He's the president and general manager of the El Rey Network. Daniel, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I, I think what you're currently doing and what you've done in the past is actually really kind of fascinating to me and, I, and I'm sure the listener. But maybe before we kind of get into all of that, maybe let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Well, it's uh, uh, two parts to that. I was born in Middletown, Connecticut, but my family moved to Arizona when I was 11 so that my brother and I could just have a very different life, go to college and, you know, just explore new opportunities. So I went to um, uh, high school in uh, Mesa, Arizona, and then ended up at Arizona State University where I got a um, uh, Bachelor of Science degree in marketing. Okay. What made you want to go into marketing, just out of curiosity? Well, the truth is um, I had attended about two and a half years of community college, and it was a path I was interested in, but it was also the quickest path to get out of college in four and a half years. That's the truth. No, no, that's good. I I love when people are just honest about why they they did what they did, especially in university, right, or or post-secondary. So I I think that's really great. So you get out of school. Walk me through kind of your career and your career highlights up until your current position at the LRA Network. Well, I'll I'll try to give you the the short uh, version of that. But out of college, I really had no clear direction. I had no desire or uh, um, really knowledge for what I was going to do with the marketing degree and um, ended up doing a lot of uh, jobs. Okay. And, but I always had this love for television. As a matter of fact, the first thing I ever bought with my own money mowing lawns and washing cars for an entire summer when I was 12 was a TV. Really? And it was That's because cool. I, it's that traditional television story. I loved television. Um, and I think my parents were, were very concerned what would their son do <laughs> in his life. <laughs> Um, because he mainly watched television. And I was fortunate enough that almost a year out of school, I one day had an amazing epiphany, just a very clear vision of what I wanted to do in my life, and that was to be a producer. Okay. And it was a, a, a vision as clear as day, and I um, within, you know, I was on my way to uh, the job I had at that time, which was kind of telemarketing in a way. And I went directly to my boss at that time. I sat down in front of him and I said, I quit. And he sat back and he looked at me and he shook his head and he he said, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to become a TV producer. And he just goes, good luck with that. (laughs) (laughs) I'm in Arizona. I have no contacts, no understanding of what that meant. But I was determined that that was my future. Within two months, uh, I was back at ASU in a master's program for communications, and I had obtained an internship with KPNX Channel 12. And um, it was an unpaid internship. How did you land that? And every day, you know, um, again, the the true story, um, because I had quit my job, I started waiting tables. Okay. One of the waitresses I worked with, was dating a TV uh, uh, sports producer from KPNX. Okay. And I was telling everybody at that time I was going to be a producer. So she said, you need to meet this guy. His name is Carl Helm. 
Wow. And one night after work, we went out for drinks, and I told him my vision, what I wanted to be and what I was going to do. And he gave me a phone number for someone who was looking for an intern. And I called that gentleman, and he, he, um, he already filled the spot, so he gave me another name. And I called uh, that woman, Kathy Downing, and, uh, in promotions, and she had an internship in the fall. And I said, great, I'll take it. A few weeks later, she called me and said that her or intern for the summer uh, had, had gotten sick and wasn't going to be able to be the intern, and was, was I interested? Wow. And so um, uh, in May uh, of that year, this was 1993, uh, I said, absolutely, and I went in and um, uh, I took that internship. And I was actually there for four months. I had stopped waiting tables. I was living off of the little savings I had because I showed up every day at 7 a.m. I actually got a key to the offices and would open them up uh, in the promotions department, and I would be there every day, and I would close it every night. And I just learned everything possible, from editing to producing to writing, um, uh, you name it. I would hold a light for uh, the news producers. If they were out on a shoot at 10 o'clock and they needed somebody to hold the light, I was out there at 10 o'clock holding that light. And I was soaking up everything I could for four months. Very cool. No, that's great. Okay, so sorry, I interrupted you. So you were, you're back at school. Keep going with that story. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I ended up actually uh, not finishing the master's program. I actually, within, gosh, really those four months or five months that was in the program, I ended up dropping out because at the end of the internship, finally somebody realized that this kid had been uh, an intern a little bit longer than normal. Okay. Four months was... was <laughs> Uh, a month longer than the other interns. I didn't leave, pretty much was the story. <laughs> and, but they, but they um, realized that I had some skills. And so at that time, a local producer named Rob Dalton, who owned a company called Pinnacle Communications, partnered with KPNX to produce a show. It was a one-time special called Streetwise. Okay. And the people I worked for at the station said to Rob Dalton, um, you got to hire this kid and um, put him on the show. So I became the co-writer and producer of Streetwise, and, for, and, and um, uh, Rob paid me, you know, $200 a week, so I was finally making some money as a, as, a, as a producer. And for the next probably three months, we produced that special, it aired, and it won two local Emmys, wow. two Rocky Mountain Emmys. And suddenly, I was pretty much cemented within the local community as a writer and producer of television. And then I got hired by KSAZ, which was the, I think it was the CBS affiliate at the time, I believe it's Fox now, okay. to write news topicals. Um, and then I was hired um, uh, again by Pinnacle Communications to be a coordinator on a BBC miniseries uh, here in Los Angeles. And so I uh, didn't move here, but I lived on a, a friend's couch for four months. That's amazing. And we, um, we finished the BBC miniseries, and then I got hired to work on a 13-part uh, uh, cable series uh, for MGM Perrin at the time. It was a syndication company. And then I also ended up getting hired to work on a special for KCBS called Buzz TV as a producer writer. And so in that summer, uh, I was able to work on a lot of different projects, went back to Arizona, kept doing local things. And then at the end of that year, I got the most amazing call, um, uh, same individual, Rob Dalton, who had secured a position with a new syndication company called Maxim Entertainment, started by a gentleman named Ed Wilson, who came out of Columbia TriStar, um, here in L.A. And Rob said, how would you like to move to Los Angeles? and work for Ed Wilson. And within a second, it was yes. <laughs> Loaded up everything I had, ended up in LA. So my career here in uh, LA started in 1995, working for um, a small syndication company called Maxim. And we had shows, we were working with uh, Dan Aykroyd sure. on a syndicated one hour sure. called Sci Factor, Chronicles of the Paranormal. Yeah. We worked with um, Walter Cronkite on a um, uh, a series that he had, and we did. We had a whole bunch of Hallmark films to sale. 
to sell. And this was a situation where we did everything. I was the guy who was overseeing uh, the extremist with Gabrielle Reese and then was Lar- uh, um, Lars Hamilton okay. um, when we were doing that show. I had a third of the Western sales territory, Montana, Butte, Billings, uh, Beaumont. Um, you know, we were doing everything, but it was a great, phenomenal time. The company sold to CBS in 96, became CBS Enterprises. And what a jump. All of a sudden, we had seven divisions of CBS, syndication, international, uh, home and video distribution. Uh, All those different groups fell under this new merger of Westinghouse, CBS, and Maxim Entertainment. Um, And I became the manager of programming and development, overseeing shows like Uh, Pensacola Wings of Gold with James Brolin, another scripted series, Um, working with Martha Stewart, Bob Vila, um, one of the first uh, syndicated, maybe broadcast shows about the Internet called the Wild Wild Web, which we launched in uh, probably 96. So, you know, early, early Internet, uh, because I was, you know, I was the young guy who had a lot of technical know-how. I, I knew how to turn on the computer, basically. No one else did. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's all you needed to do at that time. Yeah. That's great. Pretty much, yeah. pretty much. So anyway, the, the, um, the short of it is where my love fell of after working on all those shows was scripted. I really loved scripted programming, and an opportunity opened up to work with two very notable producers, Bob Papazian and Jim Hirsch. Okay. These guys were TV legends. Bob Hirsch um, uh, I'm sorry, Bob Papazian was the producer of The Day After, right? One of those iconic TV movies. Totally, yeah. Bob and Jim at the time were working. They were show running Nash Bridges. Um, and so they hired me as their vice president of development. And uh, phenomenal time to work on TV movies, um, uh, network pilots, um, uh, acquire rights from a lot of different amazing authors. Uh, it, it, again, just a really phenomenal opportunity to learn about scripted production, the unions, you know, how SAG, WGA, uh, DGA work, all from true legends. And the big project that I developed and sold there was the HBO series Rome. And, uh, you know, and, and it's one of those great, great stories where um, myself and a gentleman named Bill McDonald, we're having breakfast one morning, and I know I'm getting too into the weeds, but no, no, it, was a, it was a general conversation. And in that conversation, we were talking about society as a whole and uh, how man hadn't evolved really in 2,000 years, how the things we were plagued by today of, of re, uh, religion, uh, war, politics, things that were driving us, that were outside of our control and how they affected family were still relevant from 2,000 years ago in the Roman time. And then we started talking about, oh, there's this movie being produced, Gladiator. Oh, and what if we could do I, Claudius meets Gladiator and bring it together from the the perspective of these, you know, two common men. And we went to, literally, it was a, well, we could sell that. Sure, I know somebody at HBO. Great, I'll give give Ann a call. We were in front of uh, Ann Thermopolis a week later, pitched it. Ann said, great, we're going to do it. Oh, and if you can get John Milius... We're green lighting this. Bill and I got in the car, drove to Warner Brothers. Bill had a relationship with John, and we said, hey, John, how would you like to do a series with HBO (laughs) on Rome? John was like, great. That's amazing. (laughs) And uh, then he spent three hours just telling us everything he knew about Rome. The man is an encyclopedia. It was actually, uh, again, a real wonderful experience in my life. Now, that all sounds great. The reality of the entertainment industry is then you got to make a deal with everyone. Then you got to make a deal with HBO. Then you got to go ahead and get everything creatively uh, built, hire the showrunner, go through the script process, the financing process. Um, and five years later, almost six years later, Rome became a reality when it uh, premiered on HBO. Wow. I, however, um, went through that development process But I ended up getting an opportunity to go to a company called Fireworks Entertainment, which was a Can West global company run by a gentleman named Jay Firestone at the time. They were doing La Femme Nikita, um, Relic Hunter, Andromeda, a bunch of shows like that. And I had the opportunity to to be a part of their L.A. development group. Um, And the, the value of that is what I learned on Rome is the value of international financing. A part of the money for Rome came from HBO, but there was a cap. The rest of it came from the BBC. 
And so understanding how financing worked internationally was my next goal. So I went from I want to be in TV to I want to be in scripted to I really want to know how the money works. And so when I went to CanWest Global, I had that opportunity to work with uh, a gentleman named Greg Phillips in the international marketplace and really understand how these things get financed. After doing that for a few years, my, my focus shift again to um, the idea of an incubator, the idea of what you could do with a lot of interesting creative people in a single kind of collective. And this came from the idea of what was going on uh, in the web at the time with uh, different companies that were, you know, people would come together and just create a lot of different things. Obviously, there was a dot-com bust to that, but the idea was very sound. I was fortunate that at that time, Fox decided to bring back the, the really prestigious Fox Lab. And the Fox Lab was an entity that Peter Churning created because back when they created Fox, no one took Fox seriously, right? It was the fourth stop along the road. And so they, <clears throat> they, they hired Stephen Chow, Brian Graydon, and they were creating shows inside, uh, um, Cops, America's Most Wanted. Sure. Those types, even South Park, technically came out of the Fox Lab. Interesting. But they shut it down in 96. When they bought the, um, uh, the station group, they bought the uh, Chris Craft Station Group in, I think, 2001. So in 2002, they said, wow, we need a lot of programming. Let's bring back that lab. And I was asked to do it. Wow. So <clears throat> I immediately jumped at that <clears throat> to run production for 20th Television um, and oversee the creative of the Fox Lab was too good of an opportunity. So uh, I did that for uh, about three years. And in that time period on the production side, I mean, we, we, I have uh, this plaque in my office. You know, we produced 1,000 episodes of TV wow. in 2003 and then wow. did it again in 2004. That's a lot of shows. Yeah, wow. Um, and in the Fox Lab, we, uh, we developed the first uh, broadcast convergence show with classmates.com and creating a show called classmates and that was the first one i think i was on cnn for that where they interviewed me because it was really the first time that that had happened where the internet became a broadcast tv show in that way uh, but the thing that i was most excited about at that time was and this is where i'll get into a little bit of the weeds of mobile sure. is i had gotten a nokia 6600 from the uk okay. from a friend and and at that time that was a phone that should not have been in the U.S. or worked in the U.S. But I had some friends at AT&T, and we got it to work, and I started putting video on it. And I started showing it around. And um, two of the corporate dev group uh, individuals at Fox who, you know, what no one knew was Verizon was starting to build the foundation of Vcast. And they were working to syndicate shows like The Simpsons, clips of it, to that platform. And so uh, Lucy Hood, Mitch Feynman, and myself, we said, well, wait a minute. What if we did original content? What if we sold Verizon something original, not clip, license, but premieres? Interesting. You know, what are we going to call that? You know, direct-to-mobile idea. And the name became the Mobisode, okay. right? Webisode, Mobisode. Sure. It's not that sure. genius, but no, that's <laughs> at cool. the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. <laughs> at the time, everybody was like, it's a Mobisode. Um, and so we did that. We sold the very first two were actually Love and Hate and Franklin Hotel. Those were the, and it became Sunset Hotel. Those were the first two sold. Very cool. And then 24 came out of that and, of course, other Mobisodes. And when that premiered in, um, I think it was February of 2005, I realized that, wow, we had done something really different. But I also really understood that distribution was about to break apart. That the fact that the wall gardens of the, the, the networks, no matter how many there were at that time, and there were, you know, the cable was booming, uh, and we were heading towards that 500 channel universe, but I started to see the 1,000 channel universe, and that if everyone could watch TV on their cell phone, and if anyone could create content with their cell phone, then the entertainment industry as we knew it and know it was gonna, going to change dramatically. And so in April of that year, I went to my uh, boss, the president of 20th Television, and I told him, I'm going to go make television for cell phones. I'm leaving. Interesting. And he did very much what that first boss I had did, sat back and said, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Um, but I was very clear on what that was. 
And shortly after that, I was recruited by uh, Bessemer Ventures and Charles River Ventures to go into a company called 1KTV. And they had created a multimedia player that started on Sprint early on before Vcast. And they were doing a product. It was a news product. And they asked me to come in and be the executive vice president and oversee the studio because they saw what I saw, which was if you could then create all the content. They had the technology. And when we talked more about mobile, that to net, the technology element of it was critical and really special what we had. And the content was there to serve you know, the, the, the purpose for the technology. And we did that for six years. We sold that company in 2011 to a company called Funware. And I saw the, the merger of television and digital and mobile coming together. And so for me, my next vision was I saw it wasn't about mobile only or mobile first. It was about content that could play across all platforms. And so I went to um, Gil Goldshine of uh, Burnham and Murray, um, John Murray, uh, and uh, of course, who was running the company. And I told him, this is how I see the world changing, and you should be a part of that. Let's be a part of that. He agreed, and he brought me over um, to run digital, wow. to start creating the production, the creative, the development process that would be unique to mobile and digital. And we did that for uh, about three years. And um, I was, um, uh, from doing that, I was fortunate enough to be recruited um, uh, by a headhunter uh, in regards to the chief content officer of Machinima. And, and I have to say my timing and all these jumps were, you know, either, either in my own mind I've created the connection or I had the connection. But what was odd is um, six to nine months prior to getting that call, actually it was nine months because I started in the summer building financial models for what an MCN and a digital network would look like under Bjorn Murray. And I was working with a lot of different partners, and we were looking at a lot of different ideas and channels and how we would structure them. But one of the challenges I had is I never felt like, I was in that space at that moment because I was with a traditional production company. Even though right. we had moved the ball significantly in digital, I wasn't in the center of it. And so then to get that call and someone to say, well, wait a minute, do you want to be in the center of it? You could run content at one of the, well, maybe at that time outside of Maker, it was the largest digital you know, production distribution network, sure. Machinima. And I immediately said, yes, absolutely, I want to go have that conversation. And uh, I got the job. I got hired. And the goal there was to, from a strategic standpoint, to take Machinima from just a pure play network strategy to a cross-platform studio strategy. So to use the brand and the, unique, uh, the uniqueness of the content and the expertise of the content to be on a lot more platforms. And when I left, which was right before it sold to Warner Brothers. We were gearing up and Warner, you know, we had a relationship with Warner Brothers and it was selling to them. Right. We were producing 600 hours of original content for 13 different platforms. Wow. All of which was, you know, funded and uh, built specifically for those platforms and still building and growing the network where we were getting 4 billion views a month. Wow. So the strategy of taking Machinima as a network brand and expanding it, that's what I went in there to do. And also to learn everything I could about how digital distribution and uh, net, MCN network models worked. And then I realized what the next phase was of the industry. Where was it going to go next? Because it wasn't going to be just about digital networks. Just like at one point, I realized it wasn't just about TV or just about mobile. It isn't just about digital networks, which is what Machinima is. And so the question is, can that translate into other network properties, linear, um, other types of VOD? What could you do with it? And if you couldn't do it with Machinima, where could you do it? And I started looking at the landscape, and very specifically Vice was the, the model that I thought really, like they, they, were, they were and maybe are still the leaders in that evolution because they went from a digital network to a TV network. And at first I thought, well, why would they do that? If the cable industry is ultimately declining, right, we're seeing 2% sub-declines year over year, then 
then why was Vice doing that? But the, the reason is for what I saw at Machinima, which is if I have a brand, then that brand should exist everywhere possible. Agreed, and yeah. it should have a programmed experience for anyone. And so then I started thinking, well, what property could go from digital to network or network to digital in a real tangible way, not just show extensions or promotions? Fortunate for me, I get a call. Someone asked me, would you be interested in meeting about the president of the El Rey? And I said, give me 48 hours, I'll call you back. <laughs> <laughs> And when I really looked at that brand, I realized it had a critical principle that none of the other cable or broadcast networks have, and that's that it means something, that El Rey means to be the king, to be proud of who you are. And any brand, any company brand that has that strong of a meaning and a passionate audience that can translate to an editorial voice, then can work on digital as digital original. And so... I sat down with everyone here, explained what I wanted to do with El Rey. Um, they said, we agree. And I got hired as the president and general manager of El Rey to take this brand and not only continue to grow it as a basic cable network and what that means to the audience we're serving, but also to expand it across all platforms, to really make it a digital, or a, I should say, to make it a global multi-platform brand. And, and so that's what we are doing here. That is our mission, is to take El Rey, make it a global platform brand, and continue to serve the audience that Robert Rodriguez um, and our founders, our co-founders, envisioned you know, four or five years ago. So that was that seemed to be the long story, not the short story. But there you go. That's how I got here. No, I, I think that's great. And it's fascinating to me kind of how people get to where they are. And I think it also puts in perspective how somebody like yourself gets to where they are. It sounds like just in and correct me if I'm wrong is, you know, maybe a little bit right place at a right time. But I think more than that you were well networked, you knew a bunch of people, you were delivering on kind of your ideas, you you were there when somebody needed you, even from the beginning. And you know, you, you took chances when they kind of came to you, right? Because, and I think a lot of people are scared to do that. Sometimes they're like, I'm in my, I'm in a job that I maybe like or don't like or, or somewhere in the middle, but and they get an opportunity, and they him and haw and, and then it kind of passes them by where you seem to have jumped at all these kind of opportunities and and just kind of seen where where your career has kind of taken you but you kind of had a vision of where you'd like to get to one day is that kind of a fair quick summary yeah absolutely and when i go i speak out of colleges and uh, do different talks um, and one of the things that students always ask me is you know how how did i do get these jobs and the the, the short answer is very much like you said which is I tend to have a vision first. That vision bakes, and then I start communicating it. I'll meet with everyone. Sure. I'll sit down and tell anyone possible, here's my vision, here's the story, here's where I think it's going. Not because I'm selling them, not because I'm pitching them, but because I'm getting it out there, not only for me to really start fine-tuning and understanding what that vision is, but also because I know other people will talk about that vision. And at some point, somebody else is going to hear it. And I'm sure this is what happened, that someone, you know, a headhunter called someone and said, oh, we're looking for um, somebody to, to go into El Rey. Do you know anyone? And someone goes, you know, I just had lunch with uh, that Tibbetts guy, and he told me this wacky idea of what he was going to do next. That sounds like it might be a fit. And then I get that call. Um, I believe that's what's happened for most of my career. And look, the other thing is, I never left any of these jobs wanting to leave. I loved working at Machinima. I loved working with John Murray and Gil Goldstein. Go TV was an amazing experience. It was time to sell. I've had that opportunity where I've really enjoyed my career path and then saw the opportunity. Even back with iMark, working with the people I did back at iMark, I could have stayed there for years. But I saw that opportunity. I saw my vision. I took it. And the, the best part of all of it is along the way, everyone supported me. Very cool. No, that's that's great, man. So I'm curious, though, and I know you've kind of 
talked a bit about this kind of throughout your your kind of career history but like where do you really kind of see the state of the industry because for me as kind of an outsider a little bit i don't i, I think like to your point a few minutes ago like people don't really care where they consume the content they just want to consume it on the the devices or the platforms that they use every day and it sounds like you very much share that same kind of thing and that's what you guys are really trying to do with the l ray network and and even kind of geographical borders at least don't really make sense to me especially with the internet side of things well that that's right i mean look what what do people want they want to be entertained or they want to be informed right sure. or they want a little bit of both Sure. And we, you know, when you think of L Ray, it's, it, we're escapist entertainment. You know, when when we have mission behind a lot of what we do, there is a point of view. But at the end of the day, and this comes from our founder and you know head creative Robert Rodriguez, it's escapist entertainment. When people are going to sit down and watch something, they're going to do it because they want to get away. Sure. They want to escape. And so. You know, when I when I think of that, then I think, okay, it, it doesn't need to be the walls. There may be different types of programming. Maybe my linear network is programmed and I make shows differently than what I might make for Go90, right, or right. what I might make for a, a pure play digital across Facebook or whatever social platform. But at the end of the day, it's the brand that matters. So what I believe from an entertainment standpoint is the ones who win are the ones who have a really identified – uh, identifiable, powerful brand, um, something people want to wear as a hat, as a shirt. Sure. If you go so far, as and, and, I, and, and I love wearing my El Rey hat or my El Rey shirt or my El Rey sweaty, uh, sweatshirt, I do it all the time. And I do it because everywhere I travel, I'm on a plane, I'm in the airport, I go to a restaurant, someone stops me and goes, I love that network. Where can I get that hat? Where can I get that shirt? That's very cool. People love the brand so much that they're willing to wear it. And so that's powerful. Um, Vice, I think, has that. People have this sense of passion for Vice. I don't think people have a passion um, for the brand of, let's say, a TBS or a CBS. They may have a passion for the show. You may have a passion for Walking Dead, but you probably don't have a passion for AMC. And the thing I love about El Rey is I find people have a passion for El Rey and they have a passion for our shows like Lucha Underground. Sure. And so we hit both of those um, kind of value propositions with a consumer and that's what makes it valuable and that's what makes it where we can put it on any platform. No, I, I think that's really that's really interesting. So, but how do you guys kind of decide what to kind of air and create then? Do you, like, is it a lot of research-based stuff? Because to build a brand that somebody wants to buy the t-shirt is, is pretty rare. Yes. Uh, well, one, I, you know, and I'll keep pointing back to, I think Robert Rodriguez and, you know, I had, a, I did not know Robert prior to this, certainly knew okay. of him, but I find Robert is uh, both, uh, I mean, he is truly creatively genius. He, he is that true multitasker, can do a lot of things and does them really well. Okay. And he's a very savvy businessman, very savvy. Um, he is very clear about his brand and the El Rey brand. And when you have that level of clarity, I think one of the things that goes wrong often in entertainment is the lack of clarity of what a product should be, whether it's a show, whether it's a company, whatever it is, you have to have a single vision. And some of the best product I see out there comes from a single vision. When you get a lot of people with an opinion and it starts to be a compromise and you start to water it down, that never works. And so we have an advantage point because we have a very clear head of creative who has a vision. So, so that's the starting point, and that's the most important. Then you start looking at your data, Who's watching television? Really, who's watching TV, right? We talk about 18 to 49. Really, the mass audience in television, any of the data that's out there you'll see, is 35 plus, right? So you really want that 35 to 49-year-old in television. When you look at your digital numbers, what are they really? They're really 18 to 34. And depending on your brand, maybe you're an awesomeness, which is really 12 to 24. Um, maybe we fit more on the digital side, 25 to 34. But the 25-year-old watching content is not the same as the 49 watching content. Not always, right? In a lot of cases, 
like Lucha Underground, we do get that, where maybe the father and the son watch together, right? Sure. But a, a lot of things we see as far as digital viewership and television viewership, it is a similar individual from a psychographic standpoint, but different in age breakdown, and therefore they're going to have different likes and interests of what they want to see or how they want to see it. And so we think about all that when we start creating and programming of what should be on the network, what should be on a digital platform. Even on the deal, um, uh, you can see in the press, we are producing a couple of shows for Go90. Sure. One is called Explosion Jones, an animated series. The other one, Rebel Without a Crew, where Robert uh, brings together filmmakers to make a film for $7,000 like he did 25 years ago. And Robert also sees if he still has what it takes to make a film for $7,000. Uh, see, you know, 25 years later. And, and the way that is done for Go90 versus the way it will be done for El Rey, those are different things. But it is the same show, the same brand, the same tone, style, patina that is very unique to El Rey. No, that, that's actually quite fascinating. And, and, and I also think it helps that your, the network was created... Well, 2013, correct? Yes. So, like, getting a company that's been around for, for decades to kind of think how you guys kind of thought from probably even before, like, you shot anything, right? And maybe even before you guys finalized on a name, but to have kind of like a, here's kind of the brand we want to create, here's the type of style and, and content that we want to put out, and we want to think about all these mediums, I think actually is really good advice with somebody that's kind of looking to maybe get into any industry really is that I think in some cases they might be like, well, I'm not a big, you know, big CBS, for example. But like, I think in some ways, and it sounds like you guys very much kind of use that as like a strength instead of kind of a weakness to say, you know, we can consider doing almost whatever and we can you know support all these different mediums where i've worked at big companies before where sometimes getting them to pivot into a new space or move into a new space can take years or it's just not going to happen for a handful of reasons good or bad is that fair to say well absolutely it was one of the driving factors why again el ray was the right brand so you start with it already has uh that uniqueness right of a brand that sure. um uh, the people who know it um, are passionate about and opportunity to expand it to more people. But it had two other things. It had that independent nature because it is Robert's channel. Right. But it also has a partner in Univision. So it has the, um, the strength of the big company, but it operates as its own entity. And that entrepreneurship is really what's unique about this. And when you look at, you know, I've read a lot of, you know, a lot of um, different books on companies and success and how they became successful. And, you know, there's so many uh, case studies out there of big companies trying to create something innovative and fail, unless they have the CEO truly 100% behind it, it becomes the priority. Because sure. if it's not the priority, then everything that has made that business what it is and keeps the lights on, that is the priority. And so anytime you can take an entity and put it somewhere else and let it grow independently, that's where success comes from. And so th this is almost an example of that. Even though, um, uh, again, it is a Robert-owned entity, having that partnership gives us a leg up that as just an independent we wouldn't have. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. But we're, we're coming to kind of the end of the show, and I really want to talk about kind of your involvement with the Media Excellence Awards. You, you've kind of been there since kind of the beginning. So do you maybe want to kind of talk about why you've been involved for so long and, and how you continue to still be involved? Absolutely, yeah. So back in 2005 when I um, when 1KTV, V-Star, slash, then became GoTV, that was the company name, um, it was, it, you know, it was a really frustrating time in the sense that I was running around explaining to people, you know, people would say, well, what are you doing now? And I would say, I'm making TV for cell phones and I'm making applications. And <clears throat> nobody knew what an application was, right? Sure. People to all talk about apps and applications today. But go back to 2005, 2006, nobody knew what an application was. Certainly nobody knew what a video player application and a video mobile portal was. 
And so we were trying to explain to the entertainment community what mobile is. And um, at that time, Sarah Miller was actually a part of, um, she was running her uh, PR agency, and she was our uh, um, PR agency of record. Um, And there was this thing called Mobile Mondays. And Mobile Mondays were, you know, a small group of us. There weren't many who would come together. uh, I think it was once a quarter, and we would talk about what's going on in the industry, have a little panel discussion, what's happening. And Sarah thought, wait a minute, look at what all these companies are doing. And, and, you know, and, and no one's talking about it. No one's featuring it. If, I even go back to some of the things we were doing. In 2007, we started delivering dynamic um, pre-roll video ads on all mobile devices in the U.S. and most of the world. Wow. Nobody knew we were doing that. Nobody. YouTube wasn't delivering um, uh, pre-roll dynamic mobile videos or, or uh, yeah, uh, ads on their phone until uh, on their platform until like 2015. Sure, yeah. we were doing it in 2007 wow. and selling it at a $40 wow. CPM. Nobody knew it. We had an application on Facebook, all 100% mobile in Facebook, called Live from You, which basically had all the functionality of like an Instagram. Nobody knew it. <laughs> Nobody had the capability. Because, again, it was like 2007, 2008. This is pre-smartphone. So you had 4% of the U.S. population even utilizing any type of application on their phone at that time. Because, and it was mainly games. Yeah. So the market was so small from a consumer standpoint, we needed a, a way to start recognizing the technology, and, you know, the, 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 the truly innovative uh, technology advances that were going on at the time, and the content advantage, uh, um, um, you know, things we were doing, because it was innovative. You know, people in 2012 were talking about how to produce for mobile. Well, we were doing it in 2005. Mm-hmm. You know, we were talking about, you know, frames per second and, uh, and how to shoot and how it should be framed and how you should tell those stories, because we had all the data for it. And so when Sarah really... Um, saw that as an opportunity to add that benefit to all of us, you know, little startup companies. Uh, she created the mobile. It was really the, the Mobile Excellent Awards uh, because, again, at that time, we were just really talking about mobile and mobile first. And so I was there at the very beginning, 10 years ago, very first award. Um, I, we won, actually, one of the first awards That's for awesome. uh, some of the stuff we did. And then um, um, because of all the technical and content innovations we made, I ended up being the mobile ambassador for the Mobile Excellence Awards, which was nice. And, um, you know, got to talk on panels and go to different events to really try to educate what was happening in the mobile space. And by 2007, but really 2008, 2009, smartphone penetration really started to hit the market. People then started realizing all the firepower that was available on your mobile device and all the different applications that you could utilize. And it became much more of an application um, environment, certainly with the App Store, than a pure play mobile video or mobile first destination. And so that's been the evolution of working with uh, Sarah and uh, now the Media Excellence Awards because when you think about it, it's very much what we've talked about on this call. It's mobile critical. Got to have mobile. But media and how you approach media or how you approach content or content experience, whatever that is, that really is the new form of innovation that we're seeing. No, I 100% agree with you. I I think that's that's really cool. I always like to know kind of how stuff kind of evolved and how you guys were kind of at the the beginning of that stuff is is really cool. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to um, actually, I'm going to be at the Media Awards, uh, you know, in a couple weeks now. And so we'll, we'll get to meet in person and I'm excited to have that. Um, and so I'm, I'm, we're, we're pretty much at the end of the show. So let's maybe close with where people can get more information about yourself, the network and uh, the Media Excellence Awards. Yeah, so, uh, well, first up on the, um, uh, the L-Ray, it's just lraynetwork.com, and that's, uh, you know, to see what programming we have, uh, schedule, find where L-Ray is in your local community, 
Um, so please subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the Mobile Excellent Awards, um, I think you have the, uh, the um, URL for that, right? Or the Media Excellence Awards. It's, uh, is it Media X? Yeah, like Award? the letter X I don't have and then awards.com. Yeah. 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 Yep, dot com. Perfect. Well, Daniel, I really appreciate you taking the time out of, you, out of your day to be on the show. And I look forward to keeping in touch with you and seeing you in person in a couple of weeks. Yeah, I look forward to, to meeting you in person. And again, thank you so much for having me on the program. Uh, all right, man. Well, thanks again. And uh, we'll talk soon. All right. Take all right, care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit the show's website at buildingthefutureshow.com. Also check us out on Facebook at Building the Future Show and follow us on Twitter at Building Show. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future.